Part One. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. So, Farhad,、uh, let's talk about your presentation.、Um, you've done a rough outline, so、uh, let's go over it, and then you can go away and write it all up. Sure. I asked you to choose a topic related to water, and you've chosen desalination, removing salt from seawater. Now, why did you choose that? Well, I come from the United Arab Emirates. And we have the world's largest desalination plant. Right, that's very relevant, and I think you should include that. You know your personal、uh, reasons at the start. Say why I decided on this topic. Yes, just give a sentence or two. That'll do. Okay. I mean, I thought I should keep the introduction brief. Yes, but you can say why you like the topic. It's a good choice of topic. Very interesting, and then I can follow the introduction easily. Okay. Now let's go on to the historical background.、Mm, I want to make it clear that seawater purification isn't a new idea. No, indeed, that's a, a good point to make. So I am going to describe some of the older methods from the past. Hmm. I got a bit lost reading your notes here. Uh huh. Is it too long? Well, I think the real problem is that the information isn't in any logical order. I see. Well, it is just notes. Well, you start in the 18th century, then move to the present day, then go back to the 20th century. So it needs reorganizing. <laughs> yes, that would help. Okay, I'll make it clearer. What about the description of the process? Ah,、uh, yes,、uh, that looks pretty good to me. But we'll go over it in more detail in a moment. Okay, I may need to cut it down. <laughs> yes, definitely. It goes on for a long time and gets a bit technical. Ah,、uh, sure. Ah.、Uh... Okay.、Uh, after the process. I want to talk about the pros and cons of desalination because that seems to be the big debate. I totally agree, but you need to sort this section out. Yes, it is a bit confusing. I think you should present the main points one at a time. Okay, what、uh, the advantages and disadvantages? Yes, and talk about each one individually. Okay, rather than presenting them all together. Hmm. It's hard for your listeners to take in like that. It's all a bit unclear at the moment. I see. So, lastly, you conclude that we need to look for alternative ways to remove salt from seawater. Well, yes. Do you think that's the wrong conclusion? No, no, not at all. However, you should tell your audience exactly why you think this. I will in the previous section. Hmm. But you need to summarize the reasons again in the final part of your presentation. Oh, I see. Right. I'll mention them briefly then. Just a list will do. That'll make the conclusion a better length as well. Okay. Thanks very much, Doctor Tyler. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Okay, so let's have a closer look at the section on the process of desalination. Well, I just need to outline the principle of the process, don't I? Uh huh. Yes, yes. 
you need to explain first what desalination means. Well, I want to start by referring to a natural form of desalination. Um, and to say that a seabird filters salt out of seawater in its throat. OK, that's interesting. Mm. So they just spit the salt out, do they? Yes. Right, that's a good introduction. Then you can go on to describe the mechanical process. Yes, well, the first stage is the collection. Um, it involves a large plant that collects the water. Actually, it goes through a canal, and that passes the water into the plant, which treats it, you know? It removes all the rubbish? Yes. So the treatment's the second stage. What happens next? Well, the next stage is that it goes through a lot of pipes until it reaches the point where the salt is removed. OK. So that's the next point on your chart. Yes. I can talk about this quite a lot. The salt's separated from fresh water. Right. The water passes through a membrane. Mm, not exactly. That's the whole thing. The seawater has to be forced, uh, pumped, and a lot of pressure is involved. Mm. You need to make that point. Explain that the water doesn't go freely. No, because the salt is heavy. This is the really expensive part of the process. OK. So after that, what happens? Well, there's some more treatment after the high-pressure filtering process, but eventually the system produces fresh water. OK. It might be good to mention what's left over. Salt. And that's a really big problem. Where does it go? After the desalination process, the substance that remains, it's called brine, it's a very salty substance and it goes back, usually into the sea. Mm. It's not good for fish, though. It damages marine life. Well, you can discuss that in the next section of your presentation. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, a lot of the fresh water that's produced is used for human consumption. Uh-huh, yes, and... Uh, it's also used for irrigation, for watering farmland. Great. Well, you've mentioned some of the disadvantages there. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a guidance counsellor talking to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Hello everyone, I'm the counselling administrator here at St Ives College and I've been asked to come and talk to you about our counselling team and the services that we offer. We have three professional counsellors here at St Ives, Louise Bagshaw, Tony Denby and Naomi Flynn. They each hold daily one-on-one -on -one sessions with students, but which counsellor you see will depend on a number of factors. If you've never used a counsellor before, then you should make an appointment with Naomi Flynn. Naomi specialises in seeing new students and offers a preliminary session where she will talk to you about what you can expect from counselling, followed by some simple questions about what you would like to discuss. This can be really helpful for students who are feeling a bit worried about the counselling process. Naomi is also the best option for students who can only see a counsellor outside office hours. 
She is not in on Mondays, but starts early on Wednesday mornings and works late on Thursday evenings. So you can see her before your first class or after your last class on those days. Louise staffs our drop-in centre throughout the day. If you need to see someone without a prior appointment, then she is the one to visit. Please note that if you use this service, then Louise will either see you herself or place you with the next available counsellor. If you want to be sure to see the same counsellor on each visit, then we strongly recommend you make an appointment ahead of time. You can do this at reception during office hours or by using our online booking form. Tony is our newest addition to the counselling team. He is our only male counsellor, and he has an extensive background in stress management and relaxation techniques. We encourage anyone who is trying to deal with anxiety to see him. Tony will introduce you to a full range of techniques to help you cope with this problem, such as body awareness, time management, and positive reinforcement. Before you hear the rest of the talk. You have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty. Each semester, the counselling team runs a number of small group workshops. These last for two hours and are free to all enrolled students. Our first workshop is called adjusting. We've found that tertiary education can come as a big shock for some people. After the structured learning environment of school, it is easy to feel lost. In this workshop, we will introduce you to what is necessary for academic success. As you might expect, we're targeting first-year students with this offering. Getting organised follows on from the first workshop. Here, we're going to help you break the habit of putting things off, get the most out of your time, and discover the right balance between academic and recreational activities. With getting organised, we're catering to a broader crowd, which includes all undergraduates and postgraduates. Next up is a workshop called communicating. The way people interact here may be quite different to what you're used to, especially if you've come from abroad. We'll cover an area that many foreign students struggle with: how to talk with teachers and other staff. We'll cover all aspects of multicultural communication. International students tend to get a lot out of this class, so we particularly encourage you to come along. But I must say that sometimes students from a local background find it helpful too. So, everyone is welcome. The anxiety workshop is held later on in the year, and deals with something you will all be familiar with: the nerves and anxiety that come when exams are approaching. Many students go through their entire academic careers suffering like this, but you don't have to. Come to this workshop, and we'll teach you all about relaxation and how to breathe properly. As well as meditation and other strategies to remain calm, we've tailored this workshop to anyone who is going to sit exams. Finally, we have the motivation workshop. The big topic here is how to stay on target and motivated during long-term research projects. This workshop is strictly for research students, as less advanced students already have several workshops catering to their needs. Well, that's it. Thanks for your time. If you have any questions or want more information about our services, do come and see us at the counselling service. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and his student called Helen discussing the anthropology project she is researching. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Come in, Helen. What can I do for you? Well, I'm doing research for the anthropology project, and I was hoping to ask for some help for a few details. Sure. I remember you opted for Pacific Tapper Cloth as the topic, didn't you? What did you figure out so far? Well, I was going to introduce my project by stating that Tapper Cloth is fibre made from bark, just the outer layer of the trees, which are particularly universal among the Pacific Islands, but not exclusive to them. Actually, people in other parts of the world have also produced high-quality cloth from bark. But what sets Pacific Tapper apart is the incredibly varied role it plays in this region. Nice. So what about raw materials that are used in the production? Well, Tapper cloth is made from many species of trees. In the Pacific, the paper mulberry tree is most common, but it doesn't thrive in all conditions. In fact, it wasn't discovered in the islands at first, but was carried in canoes by the first migrants. Tapper is also made from the breadfruit tree, which is a more convenient way, because its fruit is the staple food. The paper mulberry tree is only grown for tapper-making mills. Yes, that's right. Then how about the Maori people here in New Zealand? Well, at present, the Maori don't produce tapper. Yeah, but I suggest you should take it into account. We know that when Maori migrated here from other Pacific islands, they were ready to produce tapper because they took the paper mulberry tree with them. The thing was, after they'd been in New Zealand a bit, they found the flax plant is superior to tapper because it makes stronger fabric. By the time Europeans arrived in the 18th century, Maori were producing all their fabric from flax rather than the tapper and had been for some time. OK, so in terms of the production process itself, First, the inner bark is beaten with a wooden hammer to soften the fibres. Then, the various pieces are glued together using adhesive paste made from the aloe root tuber, which is the only way to fabricate large pieces of cloth, because bark strings are too fine to be woven together, and stitch isn't strong enough. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. So now you should do more research on the details about different countries. Where should I go into now? Well, I think Samoa is the typical place known for its sepal, which is hand-painted with representations of the ancestors. Till now, at the most profound events in lives, such as births, funerals, weddings and investiture of a chief, some are with sepal ropes to add significance and eating to the ceremony. OK, then I can talk about Tonga. It seems to me that the great innovation in Tonga has been developing a simple coarse cloth which is quick and easy to produce. This is suitable for all sorts of daily functions around the house like bed covers, nets and curtains. Good point. Now what about Cook Island's tapper? Well, the swelia is of poor quality. Consequently, the breadfruit tree is often used. One type of thick cloth called tecoda was wrapped around the poles and used to make the entrances to places of worship, and therefore was highly regarded in local culture. You might mention Fiji as well, which is interesting, because tapa was actually used as currency there. Fijians used to sail between the islands and exchange tapa for other commodities, like canoes or pigs. I know that in Tahiti, the tapa cloth is regarded differently, 
because the patterns are in colour, which is considered more valuable than the usual patterns. You're right about the Tahitians using coloured pigments, but they aren't more valuable. The colours are only decoration. People enjoy wearing bright robes, especially for dancing and competitive games, and do it just for fun. Oh, I'll take a note of that. Well, the last place I was going to mention was Tikopia. Even today, it's a common place to see wearing clothes made of tapa cloth. And on many of the other islands, the tapa only come out on special occasions. But here, you see people working in the gardens wearing tapa. Sounds promising, Helen. I'll look forward to the presentation of your project. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a biology freshman at a university presenting his research findings on the survival strategies used by butterflies. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. We were required to do the investigation regarding survival strategies of particular animals, and I chose to study how the butterflies will do for survival when cold weather and food shortage could easily influence their life cycle. I concentrated on a number of main strategies butterflies adopt to handle these harsh conditions, hibernation and migration. First, let's talk about the hibernation, which means a long-term sleep in which an animal's metabolism slows to conserve strength. Various butterfly species have formed different patterns of hibernation at continuous periods of their life cycle. For example, the banded hair freak hardly hibernates in its full-grown adult form, but as an egg. And another species, the dappled white, breathes during the winter in a crystallized stage. And during this time, it's able to draw on the energy it stimulated earlier on in its larval stage. Though the slowing of the metabolism in hibernation functions with many of the difficulties faced in winter, it can't prevent them all. In addition, some butterflies have extra plans for survival. For instance, they develop a substance in their blood, usually in glycerol or sorbitol, which serves as antifreeze, thereby adding extra resistance against lower temperatures. Actually, there is a positive side to the cold weather. Fewer predators exist to cause problems. This is because they're mainly active in warm weather. So, now let's move on to the second type of survival strategy the butterflies used in winter. Migration. That means moving to regions with a more suitable environment. I'm going to start this topic with a detailed study about particular cases of migratory species, the monarch butterfly. Many butterfly species found in various zones of the world migrate, like the red admiral, a British butterfly which winters in North Africa, but the monarch butterfly is the sole example to do this in North America. At any stage of the life cycle, the monarch cannot survive in the low winter temperatures. So when it gets cold, the monarchs begin to gather in huge groups and fly south. They can travel up to three and a half thousand miles. But only the last summer generation of monarchs migrate. Normal generations only live for a maximum of ten days. In fact, the last migration generation, as reported, do for six months, which enables them to take such a long journey. These huge teams of migrating monarchs only fly during daylight hours, and at night they usually have a rest in trees, again often in vast groups. Research is now being done into what encourages them to reach the destination. It has been known for years that they find their way on the journey by following rivers, and there are a few of these along the migratory route. However, 
The new research indicates that they may also treat the sun as a navigational aid. During this time, they are able to feed, mainly from a type of flower called milkweed, but they are not able to reproduce during this period. The monarchs hand in their lineage to a particular region in Mexico, known as the Pierre a Sequoia. The monarchs are anticipated with great interest within the region, and over recent years, their annual arrival has gained great popularity among tourists. However, their habitat is being increasingly threatened. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.